Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to the Battles of American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang. And we're in... Wrapping up October. Spooky. Ooh. Halloween. Right around the corner. I don't even know. Yeah, of course they celebrated Halloween in eighteen hundreds. Uh, we got four battles for you today, and none of them are significant. I mean, they're not like a Perryville or a uh, Antietam or anything like that. But we got four little guys. Pocataglio. Did they celebrate uh, Halloween? No, I don't think they did. But yes, not like today. Yes, I don't think so. Yes, yes. Old Fort Wayne, Georgia Landing, and Island Mound. Which Island Mound is going to be a little squamish, but. If you're a little skirmish, don't listen to the skirmish. <laughs> it's like the Battle of Pocataglio or the Battle of Pocataglio Bridge or the Battle of Yamasi, often referred to as simply the Battle of Pocataglio. All right. Uh, October 22nd, 1862, near Yamasi, uh, South Carolina. Union objective was to sever the Charleston and Savannah Railroad and thus isolate Charleston, South Carolina from the rest of the Confederatos. I mean, they had to do something, right? Tried. Well, we got the Confederates with their commanding uh, officer of this little regiment or whatever you want to call it, Colonel William Stephen Walker. He's commanding Company E, the 11th South Carolina Infantry, the 1st South Carolina Sharpshooters, the 1st Carolina South Carolina Cavalry Battalion, uh, Kirk's Partisan Rangers, Charleston Light Dragoons, Beaufort Volunteer Artillery, Hanover Artillery, the Lafayette Artillery, and reinforcements from Charleston which are the 7th South Carolina Infantry Battalion, the 11th South Carolina Infantry Company, C, D, and K. And uh, their guy was killed in that. Oh. 14th South Carolina Cavalry Battalion and reinforcements from Granville include 3rd South Carolina Cavalry as well as the 1st South Carolina Shop Shooters. Also, the Rutledge Mounted Rif uh, Rifles were there, which you didn't, you didn't mention. Where? Oh, yep, the Rutledge Mounted Rifles. Okay, so we got the Union. Commanding Officer, Brigadier General John M. Brannan. He had the 1st Brigade. His 1st Brigade is Colonel John Lyman Chatfield. Anyway, he had the 6th Connecticut Volunteer Infantry, the 3rd New Hampshire Volunteer, 4th New Hampshire Volunteer, 48th New York Volunteer, the 76th Pennsylvania Volunteer, the 2nd Brigade. You have the 3rd Rhode Island Volunteer, the 47th Volunteer of Pennsylvania, 55th Pennsylvania Volunteer, 7th Connecticut Volunteer, we had the 1st New York Engineers, <laughs> right. which was two companies. Cavalry, we had the 1st Massachusetts Volunteer Cavalry. Then for artillery, we had Battery B, 1st U.S. Artillery, and Battery C, E, K, L, and M, the 3rd Rhode Island Heavy Artillery. Mm. October 31st, 1862, a 4,200-man Union force under the command of Brigadier General John M. Brannan embarked on troop transport ships and left from Hilton Head, South Carolina. Brannan's order were to destroy the railroad and railroad bridges on the Charleston and Savannah line. Under protection of a naval squadron, they steamed up the Broad River, disembarked the next morning at Mackey Point between the Pocataligo and the Kusawachi Rivers, less than 10 miles from the railroad. The 47th and 55th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiments under Colonel Tillman H. Goods' command began the march towards Pocataligo. A smaller detach detachment of 300 men, two companies of engineers, and the 48th New York Regiment was ordered up the Kusawachi to destroy the bridge at the Kusawachi and then tear up the rails as they advanced on to Pocataligo. All right. Colonel William S. Walker, the Confederate commander responsible for defending the railroad, called for reinforcement from Savannah and Charleston. He deployed his available forces to counter the Union uh, advances, the two Union advances, sending 200 of his men to guard the bridges and dispatching the Beaufort Volunteer Artillery along with two companies of cavalry and some sharpshooters in support. And they sent those guys to meet the main Union advance on the Mackley Point Road. Mackey Point Road. Sorry, boys. The Confederates encountered Brandon's division near the abandoned Caston's plantation, and the artillery opened fire with their two howitzers. The Confederates retreated when the Union artillery responded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want none of that. Uh, with Brandon in pursuit, Walker's men slowly withdrew, failing or falling back to their defensive field works at Pocataligo. The Union troops encountered the Confederates on the opposite side of a muddy marsh, and their advance stalled. Brigadier General Alfred Terry, which was in command of the 2nd Brigade, ordered the nearly 100 Sharps riflemen the 7th Connecticut forward to the edge of the woods where the Union forces had taken cover. Hey. The rapid fire of the repeating rifles quickly suppressed the fire from the Confederate battery and associated infantry across the marsh, and they were soon ordered to cease fire to preserve ammo. Right. 
The opposing forces blazed away with cannon and musket fire at intervals for more than two hours, geez, until Confederate reinforcements arrived. By then, it was late in the day, and the Union troops were running low on ammo. Right. Wow, that's not, it's got themselves in quite a uh, conundrum there, huh? As dust descended, Brandon realized that the railroad bridge could not be reached and ordered a retreat up the Mackey's Point Road to safety of the flotilla. The Confederate Rutledge Mounted Rifles and Kirk Partisan Rangers pursued. But the 47th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment Union rear-guarded the held them off. Oh, the guys in the back. Right. Hold them off. Brandon's troops re-embarked at Mackey's Point the next morning and returned to Hilton Head. He said, bye. <laughs> We're not taking these railroads. Yeah, that no didn't bridges work. for us. That didn't work. Well, that's going to move us to the Battle of Old Fort Wayne, which is also known as Maysville, Beatty's Perry, Betty's, Beatty's Perry Prairie, or Beatty's per- Prairie. Spelled different. Uh, October 22nd as well in Delaware County in what is now eastern Oklahoma. Mid-July 1862, Confederate Army started concentrating forces at Fayetteville, Arkansas for a planned raid into Missouri. Concurrently, Douglas Cooper was to raid Kansas with his force of Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Lower Creeks. Hey. After weeks of recruiting to boister their numbers, Cooper led his men through Indian Territory to Old Fort Wayne, which was an abandoned pre-war federal military garrison on the southern edge of the sprawling Beatty's Prairie. I don't think it's Beatty's. Right? Beatty's. Oh, so it's Beatty's Prairie. Okay. He positioned pickets four miles to the north in Maysville, a small village directly on the Arkansas Indian Territory uh, boundary, which was 23 miles west of Bentonville. He was within supporting distance of John S. Marmaduke's small 4,000-man force of mostly Texans, which was positioned at Cross Hollows near Lowell, Arkansas. All right. The nearest federal troops were John Schofield's Army of the Frontier, encamped at Pea Ridge, Arkansas. Word had been received that Cooper, accompanied by Stan Waddy's two Cherokee Indian regiments, was at Maysville, and scouts reported his total force to be about 7,000 men. James Blunt's first division of the Union was relatively small with 35 hundo. James Blunt? Doesn't, isn't that the guy that sings, you're beautiful? Maybe. But was better trained and equipped than many of the uh, recently raised Confederate units. Okay. 7 p.m., October 20th. Blunt departed camp with the 2nd and 3rd Brigades. His command consisted of 2nd Kansas Cavalry in the lead, followed by the 6th Kansas Cavalry, 10th Kansas Infantry, 11th Kansas Infantry, 1st and 3rd Cherokee Regiments, and the 1st Kansas Battery, 2nd Indiana Battery, and 4 Mountain Howitzers. All right. After a night march southward, he arrived in Bentonville shortly after sunrise and paused until 5 p.m. to wait for his cumbersome supply wagons to arrive. (laughs) He was anxious to surprise the Confederates who were unaware of his advance. After a forced march of about 25 miles westward late in October 21st, he stopped his column at 2 a.m. and allowed most of his men to rest. However, he pushed forward the 2nd Kansas Cavalry, which struck the Confederates at 5 a.m. at Maysville, while the balance of the division was sleeping nearly seven miles back. Wow, why? Wow. After driving in the pickets at Maysville, the Union Cavalry followed them three and one-half miles into the Indian Territory, where they encountered Cooper's main Confederate battle line. Ooh. Ooh. A line along an east and west road facing north with a dense wood at their backs. Oh, oh shit. They ain't doing nothing. Wow. Despite early federal reports that he had as many as 7,000 men, Cooper's reality had roughly 1,500. With Howe's Texas battery of four artillery guns in the center of his three-quarter mile line. Blunt positioned Howitzers in place to duel with the Confederate artillery. Then deployed the 2nd Kansas, which soon pushed back the Confederate skirmishers from a ridge fronting their main battle line. When the balance of Blunt's division arrived, he attacked, concentrating his men on the center of the thinly spread Confederate battle line. His howitzers silenced the lone enemy battery, and the Kansans and Cherokees opened a wide hole in the Cooper Center. Within a half hour, much of Cooper's ill-trained force was in full retreat, minus their artillery, of course, with Blunt in pursuit for nearly seven miles before halting. Blunt lost 14 men, Cooper approximately 150, included a reported 50 dead who were buried on the battlefield. Damn. The Confederates retreated nearly 70 miles to Fort Gibson. Wow. Damn. The Union Army once again had undisputed possession of Indian Territory north of the Arkansas River. For his decisive victory, Blunt was appointed Major General Volunteers. Wow. Good for you, Blunt. The state of Arkansas erected a commemorative marker in Benton County at the northwest corner of State Routes 43 and 72 in Maysville in shit. honor of the battle. Look at these volunteers coming in and doing stuff. All right. Like, man, we ain't even, we're not even soldiers. <laughs> Look what we're doing. We're just people. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, moving on. Battle of Georgia Landing, Georgia or Landing, Labadeeville, or Texana. This was fought on 27th October 1862 in Labadeeville, Assumption Parish, Louisiana. All right, as part of the operations in La Forche District. 
Major General Benjamin F. Butler, commanding Union forces in the Department of the Gulf, launched an expedition into the Bayou Lafourche region to eliminate the Confederate threat from the area. To make sure that sugar and cotton products from there would come into Union hands and to secure it as a base for future military operations. Oh, good for him. He also organized a brigade of about 4,000 men under the command of his protege, Brigadier General Godfrey Weitzel, to accomplish the missions. He's like, all right, Brigadier General Godfrey Weitzel. You're my protege. You're going to accomplish these missions, baby. Union force consisted of the Reserve Brigade of the Department of the Gulf, the 8th New Hampshire Infantry, the 75th New York Infantry, and the 13th Connecticut Infantry. Confederate force consisted of the 18th Louisiana Infantry Regiment, the Crescent Regiment, Ralston's Battery, Detachment of Cavalry, 33rd Louisiana Infantry, Terrabonne Regiment, Louisiana Militia, Semi's Battery, and the 2nd Louisiana Cavalry, which was approximately 1,392 men Fantastic. for them. United States Army Brigadier General Godfrey Wietzel, Butler's protege, with five regiments from the Reserve Brigade, Department of the Gulf, numbering about 4,000 men, left Carleton seven miles above Nylons, on October 24th, 1862. And he went up to the Mississippi River, and the transports conveyed by gunboats. He reached Donaldsonville the very next day. His troops were disembarked. All right, October 25th, he and his men arrived at Donaldsonville, where the Lafourche meets uh, with the Mississippi River, and began to advance up the east bank of the bayou. Confederates under the command of Brigadier General Alfred Mouton, or Mountain uh, attempted to concentrate to meet the threat. On the 26th, the Union force marched down the Bayou Lafourche 15 miles to Napoleonville, but were unable to find the Confederate force known to be in that region. Oh, they're known to be here. By October 27, 1862, the Confederates had occupied a position on the Bayou above Labadeville. A little more than half the force was on the east bank, while the rest of the men were on the west bank near Georgia Landing, generally without means of concentrating on one side or the other. 27th, October, Union Brigadier General Weitzel continued his march to Labadeville. On the east bank of the bayou, where he found the enemy in considerable force entrenched on both sides of the bayou, with six pieces of artillery and battery. Confederate forces included 18th Louisiana. We set this. Right. So we got six pieces of artillery. They're in both sides. Uh, stopping now because you guys are about to fight. Right. General Weitzel's troop began skirmishing with the Confederate positions on the east bank at about 11 a.m. Lacking the artillery support of the troops entrenched on the west bank of the bayou, Confederate troops in these positions retired quickly. Oh, jeez. By means of a floating bridge, General Weitzel began crossing his men to the west bank to attack the rebel troops there. For some time, these Confederate troops fought resolutely and brought the Union assault to a standstill. All right. However, a lack of artillery ammunition compelled the Confederate forces to abandon these positions as well. Confederate forces retreated up the bayou to Labadeville. Oh, shit. Union losses during the skirmish were 86, including 18 killed, 68 wounded. Confederate losses were estimated at 229. Additionally, 206 Confederates were taken prisoner. 28. Waitzel entered and occupied Thibodeau, a few miles below Labadeville. On the 29th of October, communication was opened with New Orleans by means of New Orleans, Opolosis, and Great Western Railroad. All those railroads. The Union already has New Orleans. Mm -hmm. The result of the expedition was to open the whole region of the Bayou Lafourche to Union occupation. All right, well, good for them, huh? Took them long enough. All right. And ending out the day with a skirmish at Island Mound, which was a skirmish uh, October 29th in Bates County, Missouri. Notable because this is the first known event in which African American regiment engaged in combat against Confederate forces during the war. Nice. Captain, soon to be Colonel James M. Williams, had been forming an African American regiment in Kansas, made up largely of escaped slaves from Missouri, Arkansas, and Indian Territory, and some free blacks as well. All right. August 1862, these men were mustered into Kansas militia service as the first Kansas colored volunteers. Damn fantastic. The United States was not ready to uh, accept black troops, though, because it's still uh, 1862. <laughs> right. Um, and they weren't mustered into United States service until, obviously, after the Emancipation Proclamation. Cro like, hey, man, we but, said you you can't you you don't have to be slaves, but you still aren't humans, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, they weren't officially allowed to serve until January thirteenth of eighteen sixty three. Right. So, despite the uncertainty of the regiment's future as a federal military force, Kansas ensured the men were armed with a mix of good Austrian and Prussian muskets with bayonets as well. Major General B. S. Henning. <laughs> that's B. S. He's Henning. Up. <laughs> they made it up. <laughs> B.S. Henning ordered Captain Richard G. Ward's 170-man battalion, Captain Henry C. Seaman's 70-man battalion, to proceed across the Missouri, the Missouri River, that is, to proceed to Bates County, Missouri. They were accompanied by members of the 5th Kansas Cavalry serving as scouts, among them some Cherokee and blacks. Hey. 
The objective was to break up a guerrilla army based on Hog Island in the Osage River near the Tooth Man homestead about nine miles on the other side of the Kansas-Mizzou border. All right. The area away from the river was largely open, tall grass, prairie, and farms without many trees. That's not good. John Toothman had been identified as a guerrilla and imprisoned at Fort Lincoln, which was a Civil War prison camp near Fulton, Kansas. As the Kansans approached on Monday, October 27th, the scouts identified a large party ahead as local Confederate guerrillas under Bill Truman and Dick Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Hancock. Okay. As well as Missouri State Guard recruits under Colonel Jeremiah Vard Cockrell when they were all mounted. Finding the enemy is greater force than anticipated. The Kansans fortify the Toothman homestead and use fence rails to create breastworks. Soldiers dubbed the works Fort Africa. All right. Tuesday passed with occasional skirmishing. The superior range of the Austrian muskets kept the guerrilla cavalry with lesser arms at bay. By Wednesday, 29th of October, 1862, the Kansans rations, the Kansans rations were running low. Runners had been sent back to Kansas requesting assistance. A foraging party was dispatched while skirmishers pushed forward to create a diversion. When the foragers returned, the men ate. And we shall eat. While the Kansans ate, the guerrillas set a prairie fire south of the camp, driving in the skirmishers. Seaman responded by backburning to prevent the fire from reaching the camp. Right. So he's burning out towards the fire that's coming in towards him. So it's right. right. Good, it's good stuff. It is. Uh, he sent out a scouting party consisting of Cherokee John Six Killer. And his and his slaves. <laughs> oh, nice. Is it John Six Killer slaves or is it Seaman slaves? Six Killer. Oh yeah, yeah. Six because his slaves who had enlisted with him. Right. So this guy's an Indian with slaves. All right. That's fantastic. Uh, the party was to move beyond the edge of the fire, but remain in sight of the camp. Instead, they were drawn into skirmishing and advanced out of sight. Oh shit! A party under Lieutenant Joseph Gardner, soon accompanied by several other officers, was dispatched to their aid and to recall them. This group also soon became engaged out of sight. All right. Captain Ward was dispatched to their aid and could soon see the others engaged far from the camp in the river bottoms. He called for the rest of the command to be brought up. In response, Seaman sent his force forward on the flanks in support. All right. The mounted guerrillas appeared in force, moving to a point between Gardner and Ward. Gardner's men attempted to make it back to camp. When they could not, they formed a line and fired a volley into the charging cavalry. Kansas men were badly outnumbered. A general melee ensued, in which most of the Kansans' loss occurred. I'm sure. Southern cavalry, who swept past Gardner, found themselves hemmed in by volleys from the rest of the approaching Kansans. Gardner's detachment moved toward the advancing line, and the guerrillas were finally forced to withdraw. Mm. They did some damage, though. Yeah. Well, Union casualties, eight killed, which include one white officer, six blacks, and one Cherokee. Oh, shit. And 11 men wounded. Among oh. the dead were Captain A.G. Crew of Company oh, A. Poor guy. Corporal Joseph Talbot. Private Samuel Davis, Thomas Lane, Marlon Barber, Alan Rhodes, Henry Gash, all of Company F, and John Sixkiller of Siemens Battalion. Oh, no. Guerrilla losses are unknown, although some Kansas at the time claimed up to 40 killed. Eh. The action was reported in the New York Times by a correspondent who had accompanied the Kansas Union. I mean, unit. Is that like the first wartime reporting like Fantastic. on the field? The heroic action of the African Americans was headlined as desperate bravery, and Bill Truman himself told supporters in Butler that the blacks had fought like tigers. African Americans were fighting for their freedom to ensure they never went back to slavery, and they knew the guerrillas would give them no quarter, having promised to kill blacks rather than take them oh, prisoner. Yeah, dude, oh, you're yeah. black. You're, yeah, you're, you're fighting you're, against them. You know them. Well, they're, t- they're killing you. Well, the unit's bravery attracted national attention, as some observers had doubted whether former slaves would make good soldiers. They're like, see, they can do it. I'm like, well, I haven't seen enough yet. Like, why would anybody think that? <laughs> Well, they're not going to make good slo- soldiers, you know. They've only been <laughs> working, breaking their backs on farms and shit 24 hours a day. They I weren't mean. even considered humans for forever. Well, obviously, but I'm saying, if anybody that would be able to put up with the uh, training and shit, I think it would be the slaves. Right. 1863, the United States Colored Troops were established. December 13th, 1864, the first Kansas volunteered. The first Kansas Colored Volunteers were rede- redesignated as the 79th United States Colored Troops. Mm-hmm. Still, they're still got that colored, colored in troops, there. Right. The Battle of Island Mound State Historic Site was established in 2012 with Bates County to preserve this area. It memorializes the actions of all the soldiers, including the eight Kansas soldiers who died in action and were buried near the Toothman Farm. Um, the Battle of Island Mound in 2014 is a 30-minute documentary and was commissioned by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources 
and produced by Brant Hadfield, a filmmaker based in St. Louis. Okay. He wrote, directed, and shot and edited the film. Hey, Good for him. And won guy. two Emmy Awards in 2015 for Best Historical Documentary and Cinematography. No shit. It has won other awards, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> right. And others. And others. Okay. Look at that. Shit. Look at that. All right. Not a long episode at all, but I mean, four quick battles. You got to do what you got to do, though. Four quick, quick. Quickity, quick, quick, quick. I believe that was a, uh, yeah, that was three union wins in, in tonight's episode. With the first one going to the Confederates. So good for them, huh? All right. Coming up next, not so lucky for the unions because we got the bar- Battle of Clark's Mill in Missouri, Battle of Cane Hill in Arkansas, both Confederate wins. And then we move on to Battle of Prairie Grove in Arkansas as well, which is a union win. So, um, probably get the Battle of Hartsville in there too. Might as well. Good. And that's in Tennessee. Since we're going to have Fredericksburg, and that's going to be a decent. Yep, probably another five battles. Maybe we should do one more then. Oh, yeah. yeah, might as well. Okay, yeah, we'll end it with Clark's Mill because uh, this one's literally a paragraph. Um, November 7th, 1862, on Bryant Creek, just north of the community of Vera Cruz in central Douglas County, Missouri. All right, that's where it happened. Yeah, Fantastic. So, uh, in November? Mm, yep, Man, November 7th. I told you we had days. like three week uh, thing between. These guys are taking a rest or something, huh? Right. Captain Haram E. Barstow, a Union commander at Clark's Mill, received reports that Confederate troops were in the area. Captain Barstow sent a detachment towards Gainesville and led another southeastward where Barstow's men ran into the Confederate force at the confluence of the Bryant and Fox Creek south of the community of Bertha. Following a skirmish, the Confederate force was driven back. Barstow and his men then fell back to Clark's Mill, where he learned that another Confederate force was coming from the northeast. Oh, shit. Unlimbering artillery to command both approach roads... Barstow was soon engaged in a five-hour fight with the enemy. No shit. Under a white flag, the Confederates demanded a surrender. The Union, given their numerical inferior- inferiority, accepted. No shit. The Confederates paroled the Union troops and departed after burning the blockhouse at Clark's Mill. And Clark's Mill helped the Confederates maintain a toehold in southeast or southwest Missouri. No shit. Well, not major at all. Kind of. Well, and all that. The Union had nine killed, 37 wounded, compared to the Confederates, 34 killed and some wounded. <laughs> wow. And the 10th Illinois Cavalry and the Missouri State Militia on the Union side fight in the Missouri Brigade on the other side. And none of these names we've seen before. Dang, so. 100 people killed 34 people. Mm-hmm. Damn. It was 100 versus 1,500, right? That's ridiculous. That's that should have been a slaughter. Right. Right. Well, that's sad. Well, do what you got to do. All right, now we're going to end the episode because that was whatever. Um, Clark's Mill. It was a Class D battery, though, huh? Yep, then we'll have Cane Hill, Prairie Grove, Hartsville uh, next week. Then we got Fredericks- Fredericksburg, December 13th. The first, uh, no, it's not a first. Well, that's kind of a first major battle. The what? Other ones. The had, other ones. We just had Perryville and Antietam. Yeah, but they weren't really major what? battles. What? Not like Fredericksburg. Uh, Antietam's probably bigger than Fredericksburg. Right. The single blo- uh, deadliest, bloodiest day in history. It's true. Uh, yeah, we only got like a month to go in this... Uh, 1862, fellers and women, if you're listening here. Yeah, we're back with those three battles and then Fredericksburg next week after that. In the meantime, go check out Outlaws and Gunslingers where this week you're going to hear um, two stories, or two stories, two cases, I guess. Of, Double feature, uh, man. Child abduction and ultimately deaths. And uh, where Marion Parker, age like 12, gets abducted and ultimately... Killed in a little brutal way with limbs cut off and right. ransom money and all that sickening yeah, stuff involved. And then another sold one. Her eyes open. Sold her eyes open to make sure uh, dad thought she, he was alive. She was alive. A whole bunch of crazy stuff on that one. And then another one with a little one month old named Peter Weinberger who was kidnapped for ransom and ultimately left in the woods to uh, die of exposure. So two double cases, kind of short ones, 20 minutes probably or so a piece. So go check that out. All laws of guns, bun, bun bun, slingers. Bun, bun, all laws of gunslingers, as well as sports history this weekend. Sports history on this very network. You're listening to the Bang Dang Network. Patreon.com forward slash Bang Dang. And if you're uh, interested in manscaping, you can go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping on your order using the code True Crime. Manscaped.com, 20% off free shipping. We'll be back next week for another thrilling episode of Battles of American Civil War, where the month of Michigan is with Bing Dang.